So our breakout questions. One, what is the thesis of the reading? Um, two of which, uh, what was the role of religion in establishing the negative stereotypes and myths about African people? And then um, what were your thoughts about the curse of Ham? Uh, who would like to share what was discussed in their breakout groups? Uh, we discussed the uh, rhythm brainwash for people like gullible kind of like that's the one like manipulate basically uh, like in, uh, stigmas and of uh, uh, African people yeah talked about like the injustice of like judging a book by its cover like just off is my answer good i'm sorry i feel like i'm cutting out uh a little bit i i hear you clear uh, but okay and we were talking about how you can't judge a book based off like its cover instead of going in depth and exploring the cultures that they were judging they just you know made their own assumptions and compared them to themselves which is very like they're they're claiming they're superior and i feel like that that's not that's not a superior trait good call out Thank you, Kevin. Uh, who else would like to share what the discussion uh, was in their breakout groups or what they feel the thesis of the reading was? Hello? Yeah. Um, we basically said that uh, the thesis is behind this text is to show like the underlying history of how, um, how like segregational racism uh, and how it was enforced on the African people and just how it took place in Africa in general. Okay. History of the emphasis of race. Cool. Thank you. Anyone else? Thesis. Yeah, I was kind of right there with Delilah. Uh, this idea of uh, segregation and keeping, oh, really separating amongst each other. We see there was a division in languages. You know, there was a lot of new languages brought up because of migration. And that migration came about not only because of, um, uh, because we also find out that it was a Arab and Asian uh, imperialism before the Western imperialism, or was it just Arab? For Berto, I think you read uh, Wednesday's reading. You read the destruction of Black civilization. Oh, yeah, that's Wednesday. Yeah, you're, you're prepared for Wednesday though, um, so you you won't. Just hold that for our next class because today. Okay, so then what are we talking about right now? Then it should be the state the stereotypes and myths by Joseph Harris. Oh, okay, no wonder. Sorry, it's all good. Um, anyone else for the thesis? If not, we can move to the role of uh, religion in establishing these myths and, myths and stereotypes. Go ahead. Oh, uh, you're on mute. Uh, we were talking about um, how in the Bible it talks about the, the uh, cursed people um, and we were having a discussion. I specifically remember Kendrick Lamar talking about it and damn. Yeah. Um, but so talking about, you know, black people and Israelites, uh, because, you know, the, the whole discussion is who who are the children of Israel? Because those are God's children, the chosen people. And so wars are fought over that. And um, the fact that these the Africans were the the cursed people because they fell from the commandments of God is a negative stereotype, I guess, that um stuck out to me. Yeah. Anyone else on the role in religion in establishing these stereotypes and myths? And we'll definitely get into the uh, curse of Ham a little bit more also. But for now, what is the role when we're discussing the role of religion? Any other thoughts? Um, can I? Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. Um, so in the reading, well, we discussed in our group how, like, in the readings, two re main religions were brought up, and that was, like, Judaism and Christianity, and how, like, if you didn't conform to any of the two religions, you would be classified as pagan, and because you were pagan, you were therefore classified as being like less than, and your value was kind of stripped away from like a human perspective. 
um, and you were viewed as like, because you don't have the same morals as me, you therefore are like some other type of maybe, I don't know, maybe like creature who doesn't have that sense of like right or wrong based on this or this religion. I don't know if that makes sense. No, it does. Absolutely. Thank okay. you. Um, anyone else for the role of religion or you want to speak on the curse of ham with your thoughts on the curse of ham work? Curse of ham or the role of religion in establishing negative stereotypes of men? Um, I think that uh, in the beginning of the reading, mm -hmm. uh, they start off by just describing them as um, savage and different. But as it starts getting more into religion, uh, we can see how religion took a great part in, in slavery and with the curse of, of ham. Uh, they mentioned something about let me see if I can, on page five, how you shall enslave the, the first, the firstborn if they're born um, with those characteristics. Uh, I think, yeah, that plays a role on how Christianity uh, took part in slavery. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? What are your thoughts on the curse of hand? So I'm not asking you like what it says in the book, but I'm curious to know what you think about it. Sam, were you going to say something? Um, I just wanted, I guess, clarification on it, just because the, like, some of the wording on the reading kind of confused me a little bit. <clears throat> so what I got from it, so the curse of Ham is basically their excuse of justifying slavery, correct? Yeah, yeah, in a nutshell, yes. Like, they, they're saying that basically God puts you on the earth as a punishment from it in a way kind of like that's what that's what well the idea is that um because of ham laughing like is it a consequence yes yes okay. so because okay. of him laughing at his dad drunk and he did his curse with he was being cursed with black skin black um big nose big lips right and his descendants would have carry this curse and be enslaved so that was a consequence of him you know laughing at his father does that does that clarify for you? Yes, yes okay. it does. Perfect. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh Gianna? Um, from what I was feeling about the curse of ham, I feel like religion, like from the positive side, you want to see that like you're helping people, you're being a good person. But this perspective is very odd to me. Like just because one person made a mistake doesn't automatically mean that generations and generations of people are going to receive a punishment so i just don't understand why like they thought this was the right thing to do or why people would just blindly agree with it like oh that makes sense like god just did it this way because that's just how it is which shouldn't be the case like in if god loves us then this should never have happened nobody should have been treated that way so it just interesting to think about what I'm hearing from you, John, is like you you're struggling with understanding this in this version of religion based off what you know religion to be in in a certain extent. and and it sounds like you're unfamiliar with like the, this dogmatic approach to religion, right? Like just because one person says, then we all are just gonna follow blindly. Yeah, I th think that makes a lot of sense. Um, Amelia, if possible, could you say that out loud, please? I think you bring up a good point. Yeah, um, kind of a bit what I thought was that the curse of Ham was, I'm just going to read off what I said, was problematic in the interpretation of the biblical story that was used to justify the oppression and dehumanization of African people. So, their, sorry. yeah, sorry. No, so in, in your estimation, it's not the story that's the problem, it's how it's interpreted, right? The problem is the way that they are using this story and manipulating the story to do what they want with it. Is this what I, am I correct in my assumption of what you're saying, Emilio? Yes, yes, sorry. So like, let's bring your comment, Emilio and Gianna's 
conversation, like re comment in conversation with one another, right? So for Gianna, it's like, yo, this shit is very unfamiliar for the way that I know motherfucking religion to work, right? Like that's not how I understand whatever religion to operate, right? And what Emiliano was pointing us to the fact is, well, this is a story that was told that they're taking and manipulating to be used in a certain way, right? So to me, Gianna, like Emilio's assessment kind of addresses your question in a sense, right? It's not that it's how religion should operate, but this is how a certain sect of religion or certain people within religion took this story and used it to their advantage. Does that does that make sense? Yeah. Good call out. Anyone else on the curse of Ham? All right. So I'll get into my um lecture about the reading. Um the book is Africans in Their History um by Joseph Harris. You read the first chapter, um, a tradition of myths and myths and stereotypes. Um if we think about like kind of where we're going with the course, right? We spent the first week kind of familiarizing ourselves with who are African people. Um, then we read some of the literature that's produced from these ancient African societies through the teachings of Patahotep. And, and I think if you are being attentive, right, you have this vision of African people that you've been uh, introduced to in the last two weeks. And I would argue that that may be vastly different from how you understand African to be in our current moment, right? So there's a disconnect between the images and the information that you received the first two weeks of class and how African people are presented on a daily basis in your world, right? Um, this reading kind of begins to address how that disconnect starts, right? And, and is looking at it from a standpoint of these creations of myths and, and stereotypes, right? Um, it states in the opening page, second paragraph, that race in general and myths and stereotypes surrounding physical features and skin color in particular have been so pervasive in, and basic in Black-white relations and accounts for, of those interactions that in spite, of stream, and in spite of a stream of scientific evidence, to the contrary, the concept of Black inferiority continues to drive in many minds. So there is no scientific evidence, according to the author, that Black people are inferior. There's no scientific evidence that supports that. There's no scientific evidence that supports that Europe people, European people are superior, right? Now, there is this faux science, this pseudoscience that comes up with notions like, well, based off of people's skull sizes and the size of their head determines their intelligence, right? But again, that's faux science, that's pseudoscience. That shit that they made up to justify the racism, right? But again, the author states very clearly there is no scientific evidence that speaks to the inferiority of African people or the inf of the superiority of European people, right? Looking at page two, it says, perhaps the best approach to an understanding of this problem should begin with an examination of some of the early characterizations of Africans in history in order to see how the roots of racial prejudice became interwoven in Western culture, which has internationalized the concept of Black inferiority and colonized African history. Right. So there he's arguing. So if you want to understand like how these uh, racist characteristics come up, history is the best way to go about that. Right. So let's trace back to where these things stem from. Um, now, on page four, I'm sorry, on page three, there's a claim that's made that I, I really I don't agree with um, and, and I want to push back against. Right. Um, he says that the Ethiopians were blameless, as Homer described them need not have signified equality, but could indeed have been intended to describe their remoteness from civilization, the furthest most men, and imply that they were thus ignorant of and not responsible for the complex problems of the civilized Greek world. So he's claiming that when Homer wrote in his, uh, I, believe, I believe it's the Odyssey, that Ethiopians are blameless, what he was saying is that they were not men, they were remote, furthest from men, right? Um, and it did not mean essentially that if they were equal, but they just didn't have the capacity to deal with the serious matters of the European and the Greek world. This is the claim that Joseph Harris is making within the text that Homer is saying about Ethiopians. Now, I don't agree. I think that's a bad read on Joseph's part, just to be real with you. 
One, it's important to note when he says Ethiopians, at that time, anyone who was Black was considered an Ethiopian, right? Like that, that was just like a, a term for Black people at the time. Now, very plainly, the, tar, the term blameless means without blame, right? So if some shit comes up missing, right, who you're not going to blame that's to, or who you're not going to think stole your shit is Ethiopians, African people, right? That's purely what Homer says in the Odyssey in describing African people. They're blameless. All the other shit that uh, Harris is putting on it, that is his interpretation of what Homer says. But all it says in the Odyssey is that they're blameless. And what blameless means, again, is without blame. Now, from what we learned about African people for the past two weeks, this should make sense, right? When you think about concepts like ma'at, when you think about the teachers of Atahotep, this notion of them being without blame should register to you as something that is logical, right? But I do understand what Harris is going with this from the standpoint of the argument of his book, right? Or, or this particular chapter, right? I get why he would say that. It fits what he's trying to argue for within the text. But I disagree. And, and my read, and my reading of Homer and the Odyssey allows me to believe that he was saying something else. So one, I want you to know that just because you read, read something or just because I say something doesn't mean you have to take it as true. A good intellectual, a good scholar is critical of information. If you're being critical of information, then you must know how to cross-reference, right? So if this is what this book says, I right, bet. Does this book support it? Okay, if this book support it, it's cool. Does this book support it? All right, bet. So now I have three books that are claiming this one thing. That lends me to believe what's being said to be true. So cross-reference, right? But if this book is saying one thing, this book is saying something different, but this book and this book are in conversation, then I have to believe that this one is the problem, right? So the process and the ability to be um, critical and the process and the ability to cross-reference becomes important as scholars. And, and I would argue not even from scholar's standpoint, right? Like, and I don't want to sound like an old head or, or like on some generational shit. Uh, that's not where I'm coming off. But for folks y'all age, right, you are being fed a lot of misinformation. You have access to all the information in the world, and most of that shit ain't accurate. So the ability to be able to track and obtain accurate source information is going to be imperative for your world. Because you're going to be proliferated, you're going to be littered with misinformation, over and over indenuated with misinformation. So you have to be able to understand source material. This is why I put so much emphasis on reading, so you know how to go get source material. Twitter is not source material. YouTube is not source material. Right? You have to know how to crack these books open and get what you need from the books. It's not a coincidence that you're over inundating you with misinformation and at the same time banning books. It's not happenstance, right? Um, this notion of black inferiority kind of being woven and integrated into the Western world, it manifests itself in so many different ways, right? Like we don't even have to be very abstract about this. You can go to the dictionary. You go to the dictionary and look up black, how is that going to be described? Always in a negative connotation. You go to the dictionary and look up white, how is that going to be described? Always in a positive connotation. So this is what the author means when it's, it's being integrated and woven into the Western world, right? Into Western culture. What's the one lie that's okay? What's the one lie that's not bad? What's the one lie that's not a problem? Oh, you, you you look good today? No, 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 that's what I'm saying. They call it something. It's a, something that they call, oh, it's just a little lie. It's a certain type of lie that's okay. It's not as bad. What is that? Oh, oh, white, a lie. white lie. White lie, right? You get that? What what cat is bad luck? Black cat. Black cat right? So you see how these things become interwoven into Western culture, and you don't even think about how they play out. Like, why is the black cat, like, the fuck? What? The black cat, just because it's black is bad luck? Like, it's silly. 
but we believe these things to be true and people are running around afraid of black cats because they won't want to have bad luck. Like this is, is, is asinine, but this is how these things play out and begin to inform our world, right? Now, the curse of Ham, and, and I think, um, Latham, you, you're, you're absolutely right because I was thinking about um, Kendrick Lamar's album also when I read this and his what, cousin Carl, right? We come from a cursed people. Cousin Carl is a bullshit. Let's call it what it is. This is this whole Hebrew, Hebrew Israelites train of thought, right? Now, I don't disagree with the notion that the original Israelites were African people. The original people on the planet were African people. So I have no contention there. But where you have to miss me is this notion of African people being cursed. That, that nah. Now, what I will give credence to, with the wrong set of glasses on, I can see how you could look at African people's historical experiences and say, well, man, They've been, they must be cursed. I, 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 I can see that, right? But again, that's with the wrong set of lenses. The curse is we've been dealing with these white folks who've been trying to kill us since we came in contact with them. That's, that's the curse, right? But this idea that they are inherently cursed to me is foolish. But it does play out in real consequences. It plays out in real, real consequences. Um, you think about like in Niger places like Nigeria, places like Jamaica, um, they have this phenomenon of skin bleaching, right? Where you put this chemical on your skin and it makes your skin get lighter, right? Um, you have individuals who, because of their nose being broad, right? They go get surgeries to make their nose look a little bit more angular, Right. And what's interesting about these surgeries, I have never not once met a motherfucker who, to go get a plastic surgery and make their nose look black. But they go get that plastic surgery and every time their nose gets a little bit more narrow and longer. No. So when you think about this notion of curse of ham, right, for me, it plays out in the abstract sense of people trying to detach themselves from their blackness. Anybody watch the Super Bowl yesterday? Anybody see um, Mrs. Carter or Beyonce get flashed on your screen? Y'all see? No? Nobody see Beyonce on TV? I'm sorry, but she looked like a white woman. I didn't even know that was fucking Beyonce. Call it what it is. Let's call it what it is. That's not the Destiny Child Beyonce I would remember. She looks like a white woman. No, nobody want to talk about that shit, but let's, let's, let's talk about it, right? So this is what I'm saying. Like, this is how these notions like the curse of Ham play out in the psyche of African people also. Y'all know who Sammy Sosa is? No? For those who don't know, give me one second, one second. Just so it don't seem like I'm out here just talking random, reckless shit. Y'all see this? So this is what Sammy Sosa used to look like. He's a black man. He's Cuban though. He's, he's a black man from Cuba, right? He's black. This is what Sammy Sosa looks like now. This weird ass vampire looking motherfucker. So I'm bringing again these up to un help you understand how these stereotypes and these myths get internalized by even black folks. And it produces some very strange consequences. Some call it internalized racism. Um, to me, it's an inter internalized black hate. Um, this is a very, very interesting point. To me, this kind of gets you to the, um, the crux of what this is all about. On page seven, towards the bottom of the page, one is reminded of the note of irony expressed by the French philosopher Montesquieu in 1748. It is impossible for us to suppose these creatures to be men because allowing them to be men, a suspicion would follow that we ourselves are not Christians. At least this philosopher seems to have detached the dehumanizing, sorry, detected the dehumanizations of Africans by European Christians. But what's important is the words of Montesquieu, right? It's impossible for us to suppose these creatures to be men 
because allowing them to be men, a suspicion would follow that we ourselves are not Christian. So for me, this is the role of religion in the establishing of the stereotypes and myths. Because if the Bible says we are treating humans equal, if we treat people like you should treat yourselves, love your neighbor like you love yourselves, the Ten Commandments and things of this nature, right? We can't espouse to the words of the Bible. We can't espouse to the values of Christianity and treat people the way that we do. I can't call myself a Christian and enslave someone. I can't call myself a Christian and rape someone. I can't call myself a Christian and maim someone, tear families apart. I can't do these things and be considered Christian, right? That's a contradiction. This is what Gianna was struggling with. It's like, yo, this is not what the fuck the religion that I understand it to be, right? So the way that they decided to satisfy this contradiction, we'll just say that these people aren't human. That way, I'm still could keep my Christian values. The economic process that enslavement is bringing to us can still maintain itself, right? And everything can go on according to plan. So for me, this is the role that religion plays. The desire to maintain their Christianity produces the idea that huh, how we can work around this, the loophole that we'll give to ourselves is to say that these individuals aren't human. So once they're no longer human, we can subject them to any type of treatment that we can subject an animal to. We can subject them to any type of treatment that you can subject a tool or property to, right? This is the role of religion in shifting the way that African people were treated and looked at to maintain their religion, we must dehumanize these people. So we'll come up with notions like people being barbaric. We'll come up with notions like these people are primitive. But let's think about this notion of barbaric, this notion of savage, right? Think about what you've learned of these African people so far. We know we, they've built the pyramids. We know all the great philosophers came to study at their feet. We know that they had a desire to produce a society that was strifeless. We know that in a heat of an argument, what the desire of these African people were was to remain silent and maintain peace. This is what we know of them. What history has shown us of these European folks, right? Wherever they've gone, destruction has followed. Wherever they have gone, people have been destroyed, killed, savagely. So whose behavior is truly barbaric? And again, don't take my word for it. Read European history. Read what they were doing to each other during the so-called Dark Ages. You don't have to take my word for it. Read how they got rid of the indigenous people and called them Indians. Read it. Read what was going on in the missions to indigenous people. Don't take my word for it. It's there. So again, I have to question these terms like savage and barbaric. Roberto, go ahead. You mentioned, um, at least in this reading, it's like the desire to maintain Christianity. Uh, personally, I think it's, that's like looking at it kind of soft, no? Like, I think we could just, oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Like, no way. It's just, they're just terrible humans. I think uh, uh, power hungry, greedy, like people. And in many ways, I think it's envy or jealousy of what the Africans had because it was, it was the riches. It was, um, it was, it was culture. It was knowledge, right? this idea of like knowledge being a huge deal, you know, knowledge was currency. And I think because of that, you know, the Europeans saw that and thought, no, I want this for myself and therefore we'll paint them in this picture so that they end up looking like the bad people and therefore they could get away with it. But uh, yeah, sorry, I didn't see the quote, huh. but I was like, no way, no yeah, way. No, you're, you're absolutely right. I, I was being facetious, right? Like they want to maintain Christianity. Uh, and, and to your point, Filberto, does everyone know what the Sphinx is? Has anybody heard of it? Like, or anyone can put it this way. Who does not know what the Sphinx is? Oh, okay. One second, one second, one second. 
Give me one second. I'm going to show you. So for those who don't know, so that way we could all, all be on the same page. Now, this is the Sphinx, but it's actually called Herm Akit. Do you see this? So this is the image with the um, human's head on a lion body. And if you'll notice, the face is blown off. There's no face on the Sphinx. Legend has it that Napoleon, the great French uh, military general, I put air quotes on great, um, upon arriving in Kemet and seeing the Sphinx, was so flabbergasted, we'll say. It fucked him up so much that he had his cannons raised and shot the face off the Sphinx, the nose off the Sphinx, um, the African features off the Sphinx, right? So when Floberto talks about like this jealousy and envy, it's not a baseless claim, right? Um, it's not a baseless claim that, to support that claim, excuse me, it's not a coincidence that the European museums are filled with African artifacts, right? That's the raping and the pillaging of, of culture that I'm talking to, right? But this notion of the Sphinx is important because here, especially when you're talking about this notion of being primitive, what the symbolism of the Sphinx is. So again, it's a man's head on a lion's body, right? The king of the jungle is a lion. So the most untamable beast or the most untamable animal, right, is a lion. So the Sphinx represents the ability of human beings to overcome their animal nature. When you raise up into a godlike state, you're able to overcome your animalistic desires and perform the duties of a god. And this is why there's a man's head or a pharaoh's head on the Sphinx. So to think about this notion of these people being primitive is, is crazy because the whole, even within their um, construction of art, architect, artifacts, excuse me, it speaks to their spirituality. It speaks to them overcoming animalistic desires. Um, so We'll leave it. I'll, I'll, I'll end my um, lecture there and we'll jump, we'll save space for fishbowl. Um, so again, you could talk about what you heard within the lecture. You could talk about what was discussed in your breakout groups. Uh, you could even read from your journals if you have those. Uh, you have to do two fishbowls per semester. Uh, you have one time to pass. Uh, we'll have three people go today. Um, Delilah, Gabriel, anyone else want to volunteer? Um, I'll go, I guess. I'm sorry, who's uh Kenyon? Okay. All right, we'll go in that order. Delilah, Gabriel, Kenyon. Uh Delilah, set us off. Um, I just wanted to say that I agree with you when you said um how you can't be a Christian and enslave people or tear a family apart. I just think that with whatever religion you claim to follow, um that your actions have to follow that. And I just agree that 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 the idea of Europeans or like being superior where Africans are inferior. I just believe that that's just being a terrible person, like people said. Thank you, Delilah. Uh, Gabriel? No, just bouncing off what was said about the curse of uh, Helm. Mm -hmm. I think it's crazy looking at society's norms and um, what we value like how of um black and white beauty standards. Um an example that kind of was brought to me was because my cousins have black and half Hispanic, right? She back in the day was kind of she has curly hair and she used to um straighten her hair out, um kind of not use her last name and switch it to my mom's side uh last name. And I, I would just remember I remember my mom telling me how she would get bullied at school too about like her race. So I'm like, dang. It's like thinking about these kind of like how it interjects with each other kind of like interests me. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, Kenny. Um, all I want to say with Google is just that a lot of these issues that you discuss with religion, I feel could be solved if people didn't feel so attached to the religion and kind of like blindly but just follow everything that is said and took a moment to question certain things. Yeah, you're right, Kenyon, but 
like that's kind of goes against what religion's about though, right? Like, like so my grandmother, for instance, for instance, right? Like she was a Christian, right? But like she really, really, really read the Bible, right? And she wasn't one of those people who just took it blindly. And she read the Bible so well that if a pastor would say something that's like misquoted or, or not that accurate, you know, she would be able to refer to the scripture and be like, nah, whoop, 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 right? It would be a constant cycle. She would join a church, be in a church for about a year, um, would get like really good in the church. Um, the pastor would start, you know, doing the sermons, but my, she would find that one thing that wasn't quite right. And before long, she's out of that church. And it, it happened like that on a consistent basis. So it's something within the church that kind of pressures you into believing these things without the critical assessment because that it allows it to operate in a sense. So I, I definitely hear, hear you, Kenyon, but it just seems like for me, within the interworkings of the church, from my observation, because I, I don't go to church, so I don't know, but from the observation and viewing things, how my grandmother mute, moved, um, her ability to critique the church always put her at odds with the church. Uh, Delilah, was your hand raised? Oh, no, that's there from last time. Sorry. Um, Azia? Uh, to add on to what you're saying, I feel like that is, it wouldn't, or I think Kenyon said it, it wouldn't be that if religion wasn't used as a weapon, more so as like, with me, I'm currently in the middle of like questioning my own religion. So I've noticed that when it comes to a lot of different uh, demographics of people, if a, someone from a religious base, I'm not going to specify the religion because it's all religions, if they don't agree with that a certain different type of person or that thinks outside of their own uh, perceptions of religion or life, whatever, they use God as a weapon to tarnish them and like exile them away from like the greater living. And it's connected to how they did it, get these people in the reading. Uh, and I feel like that is what's going to like stop the, I, I don't, I don't know if he said, I for, I think Kenyon said something along the lines of like, it would stop. I, don't, I think what would stop like the whole bad religious thing is if God was not being used as a weapon and instead, but obviously it. We've, we've been conditioned to use him as a weapon for anything that we don't like regarding someone else. So it will never be that. Good call out. Uh, Sam and then uh, Lathan. Uh, just an observation from like the whole religion aspect and how you brought up how your grandmother would change churches so often because basically what was actually said in the Bible is being misinterpreted by the um the priest you said mm, the pastor mm. um yeah the pastor it kind of reminds me almost people kind of just um putting or intertwining facts and their own personal opinion and trying to yeah in a way like play telephone you know like they're not stating facts they're intertwining the two and then giving a message that's very true so it gets a little bit convoluted, right, at that point. Uh, later, yes. Yeah. Um, so this this topic kind of hits home for me. My father um, is like a, a Christian hip-hop artist or whatever. And so I actually went out to one of their, like, big shows, and I'm backstage listening, you know, soaking up. And, um, and... I, this is the first time I found out about different dichotomies within Christianity. And they're talking about how one of them, there's a new one um, where it's it's more right-leaning or they're using something that they said in the Bible to try to take away the 19th Amendment, which is woman's right to vote. And like the girl ahead of me said, you know, it being used as a weapon but that was just kind of an example of how even in modern day, 
people are still coming up with different interpretations of the Bible. But I mean, the church, especially the black church is, I don't say it's broken. I say that it's a system that was meant to do what it does and it's doing that very well. Um, but yeah, you know, we could go on about that one, but we'll keep that there. Yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, what I do want to do before we close out, right? Like, let's not make this too abstract, these stereotypes and myths, right? And let's not pretend like we don't participate in these stereotypes and myths, right? And I, and I know these are framed from a historical perspective, but these shits play out still to this day. Gabriel gave us a very good example of that, right? You said it was your sister or your cousin? Yeah, my cousin. Cousin, right? And, and again, so... This is someone, because of the social pressure, is trying to do away with her Black features. And again, I, I brought up another, on the celebrity status, right, it's the same thing. Beyonce is getting rid of her Black features. Same pressure. So these are examples of how these stereotypes and myths still impact us on our, in our world today. So the project becomes... How do you begin to remove yourself from participating in these stereotypes and myths? What do you do when you see a big black dude hop on the elevator? How do you feel? Are you grabbing your purse? Right? These are how those stereotypes play out in our world today. And I know it happens because I'm a big black motherfucker and I get on elevators, I see how people get shook, right? So I know this is a real thing. But the thing is, you have to be real with yourself and come to the understanding that you do participate in these things. So once you can do that, then you can begin the process of removing your participation in these things. What do you mean by, like, you kind of, like, by participate, do you mean, like, well, I guess when we become aware of it? Is that what you mean? So when I say you're participating in the stereotypes is how how do you view black people? <laughs> let's, just, let's call it what it is, right? When you're outside of this class and you're moving through your street, you're doing your every day and you see black folks, what are your thoughts? Do you participate in these stereotypes? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I would say no. I'm from South Central, so mainly that, that, it's all, it's blacks. <laughs> And yeah, Hispanic, so it's not like I have a bad connotation of them. No, I understand. I'm saying this in general, but but this is what I mean mm -hmm. the the the, the, um, per, the participation, and also Sam, just because you live amongst them doesn't mean that you don't share stereotypes about them. That that's not. Oh yeah, for <laughs> sure, without right? a doubt. Yeah, I go somewhere else, and yeah, I hear this, or anytime I say like, oh. Um, you know how like you do class interjections and professors will have you say like oh like well, where you're from blah, blah blah or I meet somebody new and they ask me and I'm like oh yeah I, well I mean I was um I'm from South Central they'll always say like oh you know like as if it's a like a bad not a bad thing but I guess they know like it's mainly minority it's a, there's a lot of minorities in that city so I guess they think like bad of it I don't know I just I, I always seem I realize I always get that reaction so that's an example of what I mean when I say the participation yes exactly that's and that's what I'm saying like it doesn't necessarily happen I guess where I'm from but yeah when I go outside of that and then yeah I, I um say like where I'm from and yeah I, I get what you're saying now and, and again right it, and it does happen where you're from the Mexican community have stereotypes and myths about the black community the black community has mm -hmm. oh yeah and vice versa about the <laughs> so it does happen where you're from right um this is yes yes it does, call yes. It what it is but what's important to note is that we have to begin the process of detaching ourselves from the participation. Now, I know that you um, came to class late, right? But we have to be cognizant and careful of inappropriate terms because of the inaccurate terms, right? Minority mm -hmm. is an inappropriate term because it's inaccurate. By, 2020, by 2045, America will be a predominantly people of color, people of culture, state, nation, excuse me, right? 
It will not be. Yeah, that's already being shown now. Right? So that within the United States, this notion of people of culture being minorities is false. If you even to expand it from a global standpoint, there's more people of culture than there are so-called white folks. So the term minority is an inaccurate term that we don't use within this space. Um, the term slave to refer to black people is a term that we don't use in this space because it's inappropriate due to its inaccuracy. Um, I don't say you can't say people of color, but I would venture to say that people of culture is more accurate than people of color because people of color really don't mean shit, right? So again, these are ways that we participate in these stereotypes and myths and not even know that we do so. Um, but I, I do want to point out to you, these are the terminology that in this class space that we have mm -hmm. to stay away from. So instead of saying minority, you can say mar minoritized, right? Um, you can okay. say marginalized, racialized, right? Um, instead of saying, be, referring to them as slaves, right? They were enslaved, formerly enslaved people, right? These are terms that are more accurate. Again, instead of people of color, people of culture, right? But the big thing for everyone, and, and even for the black folks in the room, is to be cognizant of the stereotypes and how you can participate in the stereotypes. Call it what it is. Black folks participate in these stereotypes. How many of y'all call each other nigger? Or refer to yourself as a nigger? Is that not a participation in the stereotype? Now, I get the understanding that, you know, we reclaim this for ourselves and all that, whatever. Nah, that's a participation in the stereotype. And here's the thing. Nothing, nothing, nothing operates in a vacuum. What that means is you cannot exist in a society, you cannot exist in an environment and not be impacted by that society or that environment. Our society, our environment is anti-Black. The fabric of this society is built on anti-Blackness. So again, you cannot be in this society and operate in a way that this anti-Blackness does not affect you, even Black folks, especially Black folks. This is why they're going through such extreme measures to detach themselves from their blackness. This is how these stereotypes and myths play out right now, today. Last minute questions, comments, or concerns. Danny, what you thinking? Um, I was thinking about how you were saying there's like a lot of anti-blackness, especially like in the black community, like as it is. Um, and I was like thinking like the same thing because like on social media, you see like a lot of like discourse like in the community about like stupid stuff, really. Like the whole like brown skin, light skin, dark skin thing, like stuff like that. Like just a whole bunch of like, I don't know, mess within yeah. the community. Yeah. Yeah, man. I, I think that's a great way to put it. It's a whole bunch of mess. But we take this in as entertainment on a constant basis. I don't know, y'all. Better wake the fuck up, pick up some of these books, man. Put that phone down. She's killing us. For Wednesday's class, we have two readings. There's two PDFs. Read both of them for Wednesday's class. It's just I couldn't copy them all into one PDF. So it's it's the same reading. So please read both of those that come prepared on Wednesday to discuss. Um, any 